Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Crystal Melcher. I am the Client Services and Events Manager with ASI. I want to thank you all for joining us today. We're very excited to be hosting the new Applications in Digital Pathology webinar. Before we start, we do want this session to be interactive and welcome you to ask questions throughout the presentation. If you look at the bottom right corner of your screen, there is a questions box, so feel free to type in your questions there. We will end today's webinar with a brief Q&A session. Without further ado, I want to introduce today's guest speaker, Luke Banco. Luke is ASI's North American Sales Director. Okay, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for the introduction, Crystal. And thank you everyone for taking the time to join this presentation. We're going to be talking about new applications in digital pathology, and in particular, some solutions for conflict analysis. So what exactly is digital pathology? Well, directly from the DPA website, digital pathology is a dynamic image-based environment that aids, enables the acquisition, management, and interpretation of pathology information generated from digitized glass slides. I think we all interpret that statement as being able to take tissue or any type of uh, material and image that under glass, whether it's through microscopy or static types of transformation to be able to interact with that data later and hopefully, in essence, generate some analysis. We've come a long way within digital pathology or pathology in general, from starting from old microscopes and looking down in dark rooms with uh, a lamp light to very complex imaging applications, being able to take very complicated high-end resolution lenses and digitize tissue samples to provide very high resolution imaging. This high resolution imaging allows us to do a complex array of analytics from nuclear based applications to in situ hybridization applications. We all know the technology evolves. I haven't seen anybody on an airplane reading a book in a long time. Everybody uses e readers, Nooks, or Amazon. The same with the telephone. Most American homes no longer actually even have a home phone. Everybody relies on a cell phone. And it's the same with healthcare and digital pathology. The evolution started from basically camera assisted types of applications uh, back in the 80s and 90s, being able to put a 35 millimeter camera and take an actual film image of a piece of tissue or sample. And this gradually morphed into more of a virtual microscopy world, utilizing a digital image as your actual microscopy and be able, being able to interact with it on a screen. This was evolved into a process of computer-aided review and diagnostics, being able to take the information that was collected by your camera and then applying some sort of algorithm for analytic usage at the end. And we're in an era now, we're at the dawn of a complete clinical adoption of digital pathology for a wide range of applications. From here we see an H&E being viewed to several types of IHC applications, immunofluorescence applications and fluorescence applications. So what is changing? Well, the NIH plans to launch an initiative called the All of Us Initiative starting this month. And this is going to be the first US national personalized medicine program. Being able to tailor make a person's diagnostic and prognosticated environment completely tailorable to them within a medical uh, range of activities. Pathology is estimated to be involved in over 70% of healthcare diagnosis. Uh, collaboration, obviously data integration, point of care testing, uh, and the evolution of molecular testing is going to drive patient care and drive the behavior of laboratories. We also see an acceptance in the digital community, uh, particularly in this case with the first acceptance of a primary diagnosis application uh, in the U.S. in 2017. So what are some of the issues? Well, it, it might actually be an easier thing to say, what aren't some of the issues? We have things from regulatory pressures to specimen traceability, Reimbursement is a constant factor. Subjectivity or the removal thereof in testing. TCPC splits, missing slides and labor intensive processes. So there's a lot of hurdles to adopting a full digital environment. So if we look at some of the analog issues as a motivation and impetus to move to digital, 
we can see that there are several examples of why a digital environment may actually be beneficial for, to both the practitioner and the patient. In this case, we can see that studies have shown that healthcare in the United States may not be as safe as it could be. Uh, in this particular statistic, uh, at least 44,000 people and as many as 98,000 people uh, may have died as a result of medical errors that may have been prevented. Uh, and here we can see two examples of pathology in corrections uh, within a healthcare environment. For one case in point, we can look at the Argentinian president, I should say, excuse me, former Argentinian president, Cristina Fernandez. Uh, she was actually diagnosed with thyroid cancer after laboratory testing. Uh, there was a radical dissection and removal of her thyroid. Later on, it was proven that there actually was no cancer and her samples were negative. So she undertook a surgery that will affect the rest of her life when she actually didn't need to. So the point would be, would a digital environment where data is centrally located, readily accessible, shareable, and free of subjectivity have made a difference in this particular case? Maybe, and maybe not, but let's explore the maybe on why it could have. A central resource for all patient data might consist of consolidating all that data and all the images for that patient into one spot. And this can, includes combining different fields of training from pathology uh, to applications in radiology and histology, having at your fingertips one area for information to be processed. Then it's key to have a, an ability to share all the relevant patient data from a centralized location. Uh, ideally, whether that patient is in hospital A or B, one could imagine an environment where in a digital world, all information with that patient would transfer with them no matter where they went and all relative patient history would be applicable and shared easily. Consultations also make up a challenge. We've all seen couriers in process where we're taking glass slides, placing them into a box, and then using a mechanical courier to transport these slides either to processing or for final review by a medical professional. Well, in an ideal world, we might be able to remove some of the risks that are associated with that by doing this in a digital environment. Digital environment for consultation makes, allows you to share slides immediately and you eliminate the need for courier systems. This saves money, and it also saves a lot of risk. You no longer have to worry about lost slides or slides being misplaced, or slides even being broken or destroyed. Once it's in a digital environment, it's there to stay, and it's there in the same exact copy of when it was digitized. So what about the racks and racks of slides and blocks? Well, digital archiving has an ability to help us with that as well. It allows us to share cases via a network using a whole slide uh, web conferencing softwares, and then allows people to simultaneously review these images, just like you were doing it in an old multi-headed microscope, but in this case in a digital environment. But the key factor here is it allows you to digitally store and retrieve all these slides in an instant. So any sort of pertinent data that's associated with that patient slide can be used as a search criteria to bring up their slides. There's no longer looking through trays uh, or file repositories. We've all seen these type of applications in most hospitals, I would guess. And most glass slides accumulate for 10 plus years in the United States and Canada. A lot of times this results in unidentified patient slide trays or mixes of slides or slides never being replaced. So after a glass slide has been stored in archive, what is the national average rate in the United States it will be misplaced and never found again? Meaning that patient's record, that patient's tissue is never going to be able to be used for diagnostic criteria, for legal criteria, or for any sort of follow-up. Well, in the United States, uh, a recent publication indicated it is plus or minus 5%. So 5% of all slides, once they're actually cataloged in an analog manner, will no longer be available to that patient or to the physician that's requesting them. That's a pretty significant number considering the amount of glass slides that are produced in the United States on a daily basis. So what can we do that or do about that? Well, we can utilize different types of softwares and databases to access and track these digital slides in an archive. The main criteria should be a searchable database, the patient criteria, the type of slide criteria, or even the requesting physician or technician should be searchable criteria to aid in tracking these slides. And again, this should be able to be sorted by name, number, date, or physician. 
And we should be able to link these with specimen tracking systems. There are sophisticated softwares out there that will track and prevent errors from slides being mishandled or misplaced in the areas where they shouldn't be, or more importantly, into patient files where they shouldn't be. <clears throat> this also allows us to create and share digital archives and backups so this information is never lost and it's available to us all the time. So how does digital pathology remove subjectivity? Well, it does it in a couple areas and three criteria it has to have is being flexible, precise, and concise. You have to have flexible applications for both bright suit and fluorescence. It has to be able to perform a number of different tasks that are valuable to us. It must be precise. And our analytic modules and assays must be reproducible and it must be uh, able to be documented our methods, so being precise and concise. So within the art of subjectivity, digital slide analysis standardizes results. It's very well proven that performing a digitized analysis is going to remove all subjectivity for that particular slide. And it's done through by a mathematical algorithm applied to that tissue. Here we can see a couple of examples of HER2 membrane staining and ER nuclear staining. And just a couple examples of what you might be able to call from that slide are percentage scores of intensity, membrane intactness, uh, et cetera. So how does this work? By removing the art of subjectivity in digital pathology, we're looking at a couple of different things. First, we actually have to capture that slide. We have to capture that piece of tissue that's underneath that uh, piece of glass. And this is gonna result in a multicolored image. In the camera that you're using to acquire, this is gonna result in acquisition of the RGB colors of those pixels, so red, green, and blue. At that point, Different softwares imply, or excuse me, employ a multitude of complex types of algorithms to help you as the end user discern what kind of information you're going to get out of that slide. So in this case, you can measure pixels by stain intensity, you can classify by a color stain, and you can identify objects by color, shape, size, or any number of morphometric features that are associated with that tissue type. And you can produce data at the end that's going to be based upon a mathematical algorithm and not based upon subjectivity. So eliminating subjectivity, these are a couple of cool examples of how difficult it may be for the human eye to interpret different types of applications when we're looking at it. In this case, when we look at letter A and B, we can clearly see that B looks like it's much lighter. But if we remove the surrounding aspects from that, we can tell that A and B were indeed the, the same the entire time. So if we roll back, we can see that they are indeed the same. So the human eye has very uh, various degrees of difficulty and telling apart shades of gray with background information. The same can be said for these type of examples. If we look in the upper left, uh, the green colors look different when presented in a different background. If we remove that, we see that they're same. The same for the red in the bottom. They look to be different in degrees of intensity, but when we remove them from the background, we see that they are actually the same. When we look at things of grayscale, it becomes even more difficult. All four cubes here look to be the exact same shade of gray, but again, if we remove the background, we can see that they're all actually the same exact shade of gray. This also applies to color, or excuse me, to shape morphometrics. When we look at the two circles in the middle, one looks vastly larger on the left than it does on the right, but if we remove the surrounding information, we can see that they were entirely the same size the entire time. And this also applies into shades of intensity. If we look on the right, we see multiple shades of intensity that are very slightly different from each other, but this could be a deciding factor when looking at an immunohistochemistry slide. So we try to match up where that green box is actually gonna end up and which one's closest to it, but most of us have a very difficult time of telling exactly what shade of green that was. So how is this analysis applied? Well, you can actually apply it in a few different areas. You could do whole slide images or WSI, or you can annotate subregions within a tissue and specifically analyze only those areas. You could even go so far as to do a cell-by-cell -cell analysis once the image is captured, or you could capture a multitude of, of regions and apply these applications to those regions individually. And we use computer-assisted IHC analysis to help us. Here we see an or original image of a membrane slide, and on the right we see an analyzed image that's applied morphometric criteria and intensity criteria to be able to provide us with a set of data very quickly and very reproducible uh, to aid us in the diagnosis of this particular type of tissue. So we want this to be accurate, quick, and easy. Some of the other applications we work with are 
nuclear immunohistochemistry. Primarily in this case, we're looking at estrogen receptors and progesterone receptors. This can be very difficult as far as discerning not only a nuclei with a positive stain, but degrees of intensity within those nuclei. This is very important when reporting out for a pathological breast report to know what intensity of our actual number of nuclei are presenting from the stain. The same can be said for uh, KI67 nuclear interpretation. This can be a very difficult stain to work with, with slight degrees of difference in intensity, meaning a whole other diagnostic criteria for your patient at the end. A computer-aided nuclear analysis can help us with that. And then we can also talk about membrane. So in this case, her 2 new. We have a, a very difficult stain that is under an immense amount of subjectivity, being able to differentiate complex staining patterns of not only your intensity, but membrane attackness, and being able to differentiate that and categorize that in things such as 3+, plus, 2+, plus, and 1+, plus, as we see here on the screen. We also can work with SISH amplification and being able to use a chromogenic bright field in situ hybridization for digital pathology. In this case, it's a very difficult stain to be able to differentiate between negative and positive amplification. Uh, it's difficult in ways where sometimes staining cannot be uh, a routine. There can be uh, changes and difficulties associated with that. And the use of computer-aided diagnostics allows us to remove that subjectivity, concentrate on only where the nuclei are, and concentrate on quantifying the ish probes within each nuclei. On to a complex stain to talk about is PDL1. <clears throat> Everybody has probably heard of this program, Death Ligand 1, and its applications primarily in non small cell carcinoma of the lung, but also in some other applications. Uh, a very important as it's a, a very introductory foray into uh, immunotherapy targeted uh, treatment for cancer. In this case, most of what we're looking for in PDL1 is going to be paraffin embedded in, in fixed tissue samples. And we're going to rely on what's called a TPS score. And this is the tumor proportion score. We actually base this off of a, a scale of being negative less than 1% of uh, the tumor showing the particular type of stain, 1 to 49 being about a medium or just generalized PDL1 expression, and then higher than a 50% uh, being a high expression with PDL1. And if we take a look at some of these criteria, here we have a partial or complete membrane staining that's less than 1%. This would generally be considered a low or non existent PDL1 expression. Therefore, its TPS report would be uh, greater, or, excuse me, equal than or less than 1%. So no visible staining. It gets a little bit more tricky when we actually have some staining. And in this case, we're looking at a partial or complete membrane staining somewhere in the range of 1 to 49%. Uh, in intactness. So we would classify this as a moderate or simply just a PDL1 expression, and it would carry a TPS report of one, or excuse me, a TPS score of 1 to 49%. This is more of a pronounced staining within PDL1, where we have a membrane and stain that's greater than 50% of the tumor that's being analyzed. This would be considered a high PDL1 expression, and therefore would carry a TPS score of greater than or equal to 50%. What's important when looking at this particular stain is dealing with heterozygous tumor sections or heterozygous tissue uh, in general. Most of this is not going to stain uniformly and it will not be a, homo a homogous type of application on your tissue. So what's very important is having a physician or tech guided digital selection in this target area and being able, able to annotate subregions within your tissue to make sure that you're targeting the areas that you want to score. In this case, we can see where the physician has annotated this particular area on this piece of tissue. And then we've applied a criteria for morphometrics and intensity to give us an analysis. And in this case, the different color coding, uh, color coding will relate directly to a different type of scoring for PDL1. So it not only gives us a cumulative score, but it'll also break down the amount of one, two, and three, or we could say low scoring, moderate, or high PDL1 expression. And in this case, with complex partial positive staining, we can see the, the differences between the original and the negative. And the end user would, of course, then be able to mark multiple areas on the tissue with the end result that they are actually targeting the areas of tissue that they want to generate the analysis from. 
uh, with the idea being we're not diluting our sample by working in other areas. So here is another example of physician-guided selection of the targeted area. We want to be able to review, annotate, and then analyze that tissue. Again, another section being able to draw uh, an annotated subregion and then analyzing that region. This allows the end user to be very precise in what they're going to actually target and analyze. And as we see with PDL1, it's extremely important to differentiate the target tissue from non-target tissue. Along with that, there's superior accuracy within the numbers. So in one particular study for PDL1 using computer-assisted diagnosis, a minimum of 100 viable tumor cells must be present for the specimen to be considered adequate for PDL1 evaluation. With automation, however, we were, uh, the samples were able to produce well over 2,300 cells. So you get a much bigger sampling size for a much better accurate scoring. This improved the statistical, statistical significance and it led to a higher confidence in the scoring results. So this was statistically uh, able to be applied for each frame or regions of interest within frames and then also composite scoring for all frames. So the end result is you get a much better overall sample and you get a much better overall analysis generated from that sample. So again, back to the removal of subjectivity. We want our algorithms to be consistent, reproducible, and accurate. And we want them to be able to quantitate thousands of cells or membranes in the relevant two regions uh, and immediately. We want this information on tap and this helps us to overcome the quality issues of variability within the staining process. We also want to work in a centralized imaging world where we have an efficient distribution of our information. So on the left, we can see slides going into uh, a capture or scanning type of platform. And at the end, you would see a histo or a tech basically working on that piece of tissue, uh, quality control, defining areas of interest, et cetera. And then the pathologist or the end screen user after that is done actually does the final say and the final review of that particular image and can also perform the analysis or check the analysis. <clears throat> within a centralized imaging platform, you can also apply this to working within a group or board review type of applications where we still have the same amount of slides going into our imager, but then the ability to annotate and save those annotations on that digital image to be reviewed later by colleagues or um, other researchers for uh, analysis or interpretation. The workflow for whole slide imaging of H&E and IHC samples generally starts with a scan slide. That would be imaged under a multitude of types of applications, and these images composited together to result in an ability to analyze and review these on screen. Whole slide imaging has a couple different characteristics to it universally that make it a very attractive solution for these types of complex applications. First, tissue detection and being able to automatically detect and determine tissue, uh, determine tissue on a slide from background. It saves time and it saves space for the amount of scanning you're gonna do on your slide. The second one being able to use a deep zoom technology or a pyramidal type of technology. Being able to look at the slide in a macro image and then zoom in in real time and pan and scan and work amongst that slide as if you are looking at it under a microscope. It's also key to be able to focus on every field and have every piece of tissue and every field in focus. Again, if it's on the glass, it's diagnostic, so we want to be able to see it and we want to have it in focus and have it clear. And you need to have a resolution that's going to enable us to work in a digital environment as if we were looking down a microscope. And here are some examples of that. Here is a whole slide piece of H&E tissue uh, and just an overview of a 4X type of application of the entire slide. At that point, we can actually start to zoom in and we want a software that's easy to navigate. We want to be able to zoom around and move to different parts of interest within that tissue while knowing where we actually are. And so we can move to different magnifications like 5X, 10X, 20X, 40 and beyond. The idea being a whole slide image should have high resolution enough for you to zoom in and be able to work and then actually continue to zoom in a digital way uh, to garner even more information. We can also use Brightfield whole slide imaging technology to create a seamless workflow and bridge the gap between Brightfield and fluorescence or fish pathology. 
Uh, and in this case, a key factor here would be able to do a tissue match or being able to join and target a fish location on a piece of tissue by using the correlating IHC or H&E slide to guide us. And in this case, we have an alternative to traditional fluorescent microscopy, being able to combine them both on an automated slide scanner. So the benefits of going digital with fluorescence are moving from a manual microscope uh, count to an automated computer-assisted image process is faster, and it produces a lot more cells and a lot more results. You end up with a precise high volume cellular acquisition where you're able to capture hundreds of cells in a short period of time as opposed to only a handful with traditional micro microscopy. And each of these actually can be categorized as you're going through them in real time. So you can check your work and also have a cumulative data file at the end. With this, each fish probe is quantified in a cell uh, automatically where you don't actually have to change filters or move through a counting clicker. And then, of course, the main one is digital copies of slides never fade. Once it's acquired, you don't have to worry about any of your probes burning out under light or diminishing in quality over time. It's always going to be the same quality. It's always going to have a digital copy of that capture. Z-stacking or, or multiple plane imaging is also very vital to this type of application, particularly when we're using a fish probe. So in this case, I have a representation of a slide with orange and green fish probes within that tissue. And if we imagine if we had only scanned this one time or gone through one layer, we would end up probably missing quite a lot of those probes. And our end result on our digital slide is going to look a lot different than what we might have looked at if we were going under traditional microscopy. So how do we solve that problem? Well, the, prob the solution is to actually image multiple lines, multiple Z stacks within that tissue to make sure that we're hitting all applicable areas of where a probe might actually reside within the tissue. And then compositing that data to create a slide that gives us a flat field representation of all the digital image, or excuse me, digital data that was present on that fish slide. This ensures that we're hitting all areas and we're not missing any probes. And this can become incredibly important when we're looking at amplifications, fusions, break aparts, et cetera. We can also take these digitally and blend multiple sections together. At times, if you're not doing a Z-stack, you may not get all the information that's present on your cell. So by taking five or six different planes and blending them together, we can see a lot more information than if we had just taken one. In this case, we see a fusion uh, with an additional two single probes by itself that would have otherwise been very difficult to detect without having a Z-stack. This reveals data that would have otherwise been missed, so it's very important to us for quantification of different types of fish applications. Within fluorescence analysis, there are many different ways we can apply fish te or this technology. We can work in tissue-based fish, heme-based fish, or cyto and suspension fish. And some of the components we're going to use there are going to be tissue matching, cell segmentation, and cell classification. To start with cell segmentation, before we see just the raw image of where our cells, and the need here is to be able to pull out cells that match a morphometric criteria that's going to be important for what we're wanting to quantify. And in this case, once this is done, we'll then go ahead and perform the analysis. Within tissue matching, we have the ability to take a whole slide tissue from a digital copy, annotate it, as we see here, and then actually combine it with the whole slide fish. And in this case, it allows us to combine that analysis and be very precise, with the idea being that we're targeting only the region of tumor that's going to produce the type of fish expression that we expect to see on this slide. We don't want to be scanning and looking in areas uh, on the fish slide where there's actually no tumor present. And this allows us to be very precise where we get a visual copy of the H&E or IHC slide and where we are on that slide, and then transferring that data directly over to the fish slide to ensure we're in the proper area. So the need for tissue matching is obvious. If you look at conventional methodology, the selection for a tumor region for a fish slide can go from anything from etching a piece of glass, manually scratching it, to trying to line them up by hand, upside down, and drawing with a marker uh, on the annotated regions from a pathologist or a tech on the areas that are going to be important for what you're trying to do. Well the results of this can be very dramatic. It's not very accurate, 
and you can often miss a lot of tumor areas, particularly in heterozygous tissue. And in one case, you may end up with a image, as we see here on the left, where there actually was no tumor present for what you're looking for. Uh, well, we actually want to be very precise in image areas. They're only going to have the piece of tumor expression that we're looking for. In this case, we have a complex version of how tissue matching or complex piece of tissue and how simplistic it is to actually match these using a digital file. So on the right hand side, we see our fish and on the left hand side, we see our H&E. The pathologist has annotated a region. The technician has also added that annotated region digitally. And then the system mirrors that on the fish line. We can also overcome problems of orientation. Uh, a lot of times coming off of uh, histology, the orientation may be flipped. It may be not perfect and concise. Well, with a digital tissue matching, the software will actually take over and help us for that. And it will automatically orient and flip the tissue to match where the H&E is. So you never have to worry that you're marking errors in the H&E and they're not going to be picked up on the fluorescent side. It's going to automatically calculate where that tissue's position is and make sure that you're working in the proper area. The idea behind all this is to be able to perform a fish type of application with diagnostic confidence. Again, you want to be able to annotate the region of interest, validate that you are in that area and do your analysis and then report them out. This has some practical applications when applied in laboratory types of criteria. One of them being turnaround time. If we looked at, uh, from this particular lab, a uh, manual method of trying to locate a area of fish tumor specific uh, to the analysis needing to be done, the amount of time it took using existing methods was almost double the amount of time when done in a digital way. So the digital tissue matching saved this particular laboratory almost 48% of time what they're doing. That's a lot of tech time when you amplify this over multiple slides per day, multiple slides per week, hundreds of slides per month. It also has a benefit of aiding in accuracy. So in this particular study, there was a 55% increase in accuracy, meaning the area that you were performing analysis produced statistical relevant data uh, compared to when you were manually trying to interpret areas. So the end result is, when you're actually diagnostically confident that you're in the right area of the tumor expression when guided by a bright field slide, your end result is going to be, in this case, 55% accurate, or excuse me, more accurate uh, than when it was by manual. And that also transfers over to cell detection success, being able to interpret and capture more cells quicker than when done when a manual environment. And again, overall, when we apply these two types of applications together, the technologist time drastically reduced even further, down to a 66% cost savings in time. Uh, being able to work in a digital environment, you digitally match that bright field slide, proved to be statistically very relevant in saving our time for this particular laboratory time. We also can look at some of the enhanced tools for fish acquisition. In this case, being able to segment out, sorry about that, segment out individual cells from a heme-based application and then being able to quantify those probes and uh, apply different types of enhancements. Some of the practical applications of this within hematology might be BCR-ABLE. So being able to look at fusions uh, and then break apart, or excuse me, translocations, and being able to enumerate them in real time. And in this case, being able to capture hundreds of cells within the span of a couple minutes and then actually having the analysis go through and look for these complicated uh, relocations of fish patterns to give you significant diagnostics uh, at the end. In this particular case, we're looking at greater than 400 cells in under two and a half minutes. Continuing in a suspension-based fish, it's very important to be able to not only utilize the fish that you, or excuse me, the cells that you want to acquire, but it's also very important to exclude cells you don't want to acquire. Digital technology will allow you to actually set morphometric parameters to exclude or include different types of cells. And here we can see a categorized gallery of cells that have similar base criteria of what we're looking for. Uh, and we can set this based upon the size of the nuclei, the overall roundness of the nuclei, and even the intensity of the stain. And we can apply very similar aspects to the fish probes within that nucleus itself 
being able to exclude things that may not be bright and are just background, or being able to even measure where probes might be interacting with each other as far as distances and break aparts and et cetera. Eurovision within cytology proves to be a bit of a difficult challenge when doing it manually. But when applying this in a digital fashion, it becomes much more manageable. We can see why it might be difficult when we're looking at this manually. We've all probably looked at this. When you have a cell and you're trying to quantitate four different sets of probes and their values in relations to each other. Well, when we're doing this in a digital method, the software and the system will go through and capture hundreds of cells within a, a range of a few minutes and then be able to actually separate them out to verify what's actually going on. So in this case, you have the ability to do a 3D or Z stacking review and be able to break out each abnormality on its own to verify that that's actually the type of decision you're going to make in calling a cell. And in this case, we see where the gold, red, green, and aqua are separated out. And then we also get a cognitive layer put together where we can see them together in the nuclei itself. <clears throat> Immunofluorescence also poses complex problems, but also uh, allows us to apply new solutions and new techniques for analysis. In this case, we see a lot of tissue here and a lot of different colors of the nuclei. So the idea with using a digital-based application is being able to auto-segment out cells or tissue and then measure the statistics that go along with this. And this may be looking at something like a protein expression or even just an overall intensity scoring in an environment of tissue. With that, we want to be able to also look at more quantitative data, things like co-localization types of analysis or the interaction of one stain on another. In this case, we can see within a, a cell where we have the nuclei interacting with some of the cytoplasmic scoring around it. Well, digital applications in this field allow us to quantitate not only how many of these applications or how many of these are in our environment, but it also lets us know the intensity and the average area of each stain that's involved. So we get a comprehensive environment. When we combine this type of technology, uh, immunofluorescence, and even going into a, a hyperspectral type of world, we can then actually do much more complex applications. Uh, in this case, we see a 3D rendering being built from single frame Z-stack types of applications within immunofluorescence, being able to take these, composite them together, and create a digital structure from hyperspectral or immunofluorescence data. This can be uh, very useful for us in analyzing structures within uh, protein expression or uptake types of inhibitors. So analysis from digitally scanned slides is improving and it's evolving all the time. We've come a long, long way from looking at bright field microscopes with a candlelight to very high complex digital uh, and digital analysis applications, but the path is just beginning. Uh, I want you to thank you and I want to thank ASI, and of course, acknowledgements to the people that have contributed to this presentation and to this analysis. And in disclosure again, I am the Director uh, of Sales for North America for ASI. With that, we'll open it up for any questions. Okay, <clears throat> first question is, how do you differentiate the appropriate areas in heterozygous tissue using fish samples? Um, to expand upon what we covered earlier in the presentation, I think tissue matching uh, with a, a bright field slide is going to be critical in this area. The, the reason being, you lose all morphometrics and relevant uh, data when you're looking at a simple DAPI stain within tissue. It's very difficult to tell the morphology of the tumor. When we're looking at an h &E or an IHC slide, these particular types of stains will help us to easily recognize visually where that relevant tumor data is. By able to do an easy and user intuitive methodology to link these slides, I think you get a, a much better application of being able to differentiate between heterozygous tumor pieces, particularly the applications and being able to separate these out by annotating. I think it's a crucial factor uh, in some things, being able to draw individual regions around uh, the tumor if you want to analyze and excluding other areas that may be background, stromal, or just not relevant tumor data. Another question, 
how do you work with different antibodies uh, in IHC, uh, particularly in PDL1? Uh, good question. Um, so there are currently four uh, well used different antibody clones with PDL1. I'm sure there are many more being uh, developed now and will come into play. But I think what you want to do with working in different types of antibodies in your laboratory, particularly with digital pathology, is always validate. You're, you're going to validate everything. And I think you should always follow the prescribed methods on the product labeling itself and always use it as its intended use. Uh, with that, you can validate different types of applications in PDO one if you're working on one clone to another uh, and work in a consistent cap regulated type of environment. Um, these things change so often, uh, it, it's very difficult to keep up with uh, different types of applications that have been uh, signed off on for one particular type of antibody. So I think in a much more dynamic environment, it's easier just to maintain validations and follow known CAP procedures. Okay, uh, I don't think we have any other questions. So I would like to thank everybody for attending, um, and I hope this was useful. Uh, if there are other further questions, you may either email the administrator for this pr presentation or just contact us directly at ASI's website. Thank you, everybody, and have a great day.